Hey, happy Friday. This week we learned that an AI CEO has been running a major tech company for multiple months successfully now. Well, sort of, that is. ChatGPT4 and MidJourney5 just came out, and the CIA also asked the tech industry to finally start helping them with spying on people. I promise we are totally not living in an AI dystopia just yet. Well, I think so at least. <laughs> Welcome to the Friday Checkout. This video was sponsored by NordPass. Okay, this week's brief starts with Samsung releasing new mid-range phones in the form of the A54 and the A34. These are fairly standard generational upgrades and the A54 is launching globally for $450, while the cheaper A34 is so far only promised for Europe and Asia. Google, meanwhile, couldn't put the lid on their upcoming devices, with the Pixel Fold showing up in leaked retail listings, the Pixel 8 Pro popping up in renders from the trusty OnLeaks, with a new sensor in the camera array, and the Pixel 7a appearing in the wild already, with Vietnamese tech site Zing News doing a whole photo shoot with the model wild. And on the official announcements front, Google actually finally killed the Google Glass. And if you're like, wait a second, hasn't the Google Glass been killed a long time ago? Well, actually, not quite. Like almost every good consumer product that flopped, this too was kept alive as an enterprise edition for eight full years, but that is now going away too. Then in fun news, a new app was launched that turns the cover screen of the Oppo Find N2 Flip into a fully functioning mini phone instead of the limited widgets viewer that it currently is. And given that it is a 3.26 inch screen, it's actually almost as big as the original iPhone's 3.5 inch screen was. So maybe it's not actually mini and we just got used to giant things. Next, Epic got hit with a pretty massive $245 million fine by the US FTC this week, both for dark patterns in Fortnite's in-game purchases and then for locking the accounts of those who complained about them. This is the company that claimed to be the pro-consumer good guy in their lawsuit against the big and evil Apple, so just a reminder that no company is actually your friend. Except mine, of course. I am your friend. Please buy all of my products, subscribe to all of my sponsors, and thank you very much, my friend. And in less fun news, Meta announced its second round of layoffs with another 10,000 jobs gone, along with the 11,000 earlier, bringing its workforce back to almost pre-pandemic levels. T-Mobile announced buying Mint Mobile for $1.35 billion, which is good if you're called Ryan Reynolds, but bad if you're not and if you like having competition. And as you have probably already heard, Silicon Valley Bank collapsed, freaking out plenty of tech startups until the government told them to just chill. This week it also became a popular discussion topic that podcast bros are apparently unattractive and not to be dated. So to protect my reputation and sex appeal, I've decided to switch my usual podcast bro doppelganger, Tristan, for my actual girlfriend, Maya, in this week's podcast for a special episode. Actually, Tristan is on a well-deserved holiday, but Maya used to work for multiple smart home companies and their smart home news this week to talk about with Matter, so I decided to bring her on. Links to the show are down in the description. Okay, our first story of the week is a Chinese company called NetDragon appointing an AI-based CEO named Tang Yu as the chief executive of one of its main subsidiaries. And since the appointment, the company has apparently significantly outperformed the average index of other companies listed on the same exchange. So the company NetDragon is a fairly big developer of education software and also video games, both using their own franchises and ones that they license. That is focused on the Chinese and the North American markets for the most part, and it has hit revenues of over $2 billion a year, so it is definitely no small fish. Their AI CEO was appointed in August of 2022, according to the official investment document, so about half a year ago. It was responsible for, quote, reviewing high-level analytics, making leadership decisions, assessing risks, and fostering an efficient workplace, and the company happily declared that she worked 24-7, did not sleep, and was compensated a proud $0 per year. Happily declaring that your employees don't need to be paid at all is kind of awkward in my opinion, but still cutting CEO pay is actually a very attractive proposition. As the magazine Hustle points out, the average CEO pay has apparently gone from 20x of what other employees earn to almost 400x in the last few decades, and CEOs who are paid more actually tend to underperform versus their peers who earn less. So clearly those payments are an attractive target. 
Sadly, the details of this AI CEO's day-to-day -day job are kind of limited, so while I think it is a fun story, some caution is advised, of course. In some documents, Tang Yu is described as a tool, not an actual CEO, I suppose, and I find it hard to imagine that humans wouldn't still have the final say in most matters. Companies already use enterprise software that helps analyze data, automates processes, and helps management make better decisions, so maybe this company just built a virtual avatar with a name and the title that sits on top of such software, and the company specifically says that their new AI CEO is a recent progress in the metaverse, which suggests that the main innovation here is indeed probably just the personification of this software tool through its avatar and its title. Still kind of an interesting concept. If you make enterprise software sophisticated enough where it seems intelligent, you give it a name and you call it a CEO, how will people treat it? Something to think about. Okay, for my second story of the week, we have more AI updates to talk about, but this time about tools that you yourself can actually use. First, the brand new Midjourney 5 and ChatGPT4 just rolled out this week. Midjourney is the ultra popular image generation tool, and version 5 seems to create much more detailed and realistic images than previous versions, while most importantly, also finally not messing up fingers and hands. Fingers crossed, it actually works. Oh wait. <laughs> Meanwhile, ChatGPT4 was officially revealed, and the internet is already full with insane demos of what it can do, including coding whole games like Tetris or Snake from scratch using simple instructions, turning a photo of a poorly drawn sketch into an actual functioning website in an instant, passing essentially every single type of standardized test in the US with ease, or looking at meme images and being able to accurately describe what is funny about them. That last one is definitely the most useful of the bunch, of course. So while that all sounds very fancy, it also turned out that this week that apparently Bing AI was already running some version of GPT-4 this whole time just in disguise, and given that that had its fair share of problems, it's far from guaranteed that chat GPT-4 will be as revolutionary as we might think. Anyway, the AI community is actually quite upset at OpenAI for not explaining how their new model works, which goes against the original concepts of OpenAI. It's kind of in the name. OpenAI's original claim was that they were a non-profit that was free of financial obligations, so they could play nice, and they have been very open in the past. But I guess once billions of dollars start flying around, some ideals become a little harder to stick to. Anyway, Google this week also finally stepped into the ring to compete by announcing its own generative AI, rolling out to Google Workspace Gmail, Slides, Docs, Sheets, etc. So I guess we will at the very least see what real AI companies Competition can look like very soon. Okay, enough with the AI news. Now for my third story of the week, we have to talk about the CIA politely asking the tech industry to please help them with hacking people. So polite of them. So the CIA's David Cohen attended South by Southwest, yes, the music and tech festival, weirdly enough, and he put out an open call for tech, ranging from wireless technologies to quantum computing, biotech, battery and semiconductor technologies, asking those with leading edge knowledge to consider collaborating with the agency or joining them because, quote, supercharged spies are exactly what you want and what you deserve. And uh, is it exactly what I want or is it exactly what he wants? Maybe he's just confused about the pronouns here. Happens to the best of us. Anyway, Mr. Cohen talked about the growing use of surveillance tools by undercover agents and said that if you have any good ideas, we'd be happy to hear about them afterwards. Afterwards, of course, refers to him inviting the attendees at South by Southwest to join him for a friendly chat after his presentation about world domination. And of course, they declared that their primary target was China. Just over a week ago, the director of the CIA said that I think the revolution in technology is not only the main arena for competition with the People's Republic of China, it's also the main determinant for our future as an intelligence service as well. Of course, history has proven about a million times that whatever tech that the agency does acquire to fight foreign adversaries will eventually be used to spy on your random text messages too, but oh well. Now, the easiest and most frequent way that people actually do get hacked online does not include any quantum computers or any crazy technology, but simply weak and reused passwords. And I'm here to tell you that the solution to that is a good password manager like NordPass. 
Like any good password manager, NordPass of course first and foremost reliably stores all of your passwords, credit cards, addresses and whatever else that you want to remember and it autofills those across all of your devices so there's no need to worry if you ever want to switch between Android or iOS or various browsers. But beside the basics, NordPass also automatically generates unique and high quality passwords for you to whichever specification that you want. It allows you to securely share those passwords with others so that they can access them without having to send things in plain text. It allows you to set an emergency contact in case something goes very wrong with you and it automatically alerts you if one of your logins has been compromised and there was a leak somewhere. The whole thing works super well and of course it's also very safe. NordPass uses the newest encryption tech like XChaCha20, great name by the way, and that tech is used to encrypt all of your info on your device before it ever reaches a Nord server so they or hackers couldn't read them even if they somehow got access. Nord supports two-factor authentication including with apps or hardware keys like YubiKey if you want to get serious about security, which is what I do personally. Their tech has been audited by an independent security company and Nord is also a billion dollar company whose sole purpose is cybersecurity so they are unlikely to disappear overnight or stop providing the service as they get bored or bought up by someone. Now while you can try NordPass for free, they actually give my viewers access to their best offer if you go for the full premium package with all of the features that I've just described. You can either go to nordpass.com slash checkout Nord or use my code checkout Nord at checkout to get one additional month of service for free. Once again, you get an extra month for free as well as the best price if you use my link that is nordpass.com slash checkout Nord or my code which is just checkout Nord. So check them out. I hope you like them and I'll see you in the next video.